Good afternoon. I will begin with one overarching message. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The economy and the country have been through a lot over the past two and a half years and have proved resilient. It is essential that we bring inflation down if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. Against this backdrop, today the Federal Open Market Committee raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point and anticipates that ongoing increases in that rate will be appropriate. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. I'll have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. Overall economic activity edged down <clears throat> in the first quarter as unusually sharp swings in inventories and net exports more than offset continued strong underlying demand. Recent indicators suggest that real GDP growth has picked up this quarter, with consumption spending remaining strong. In contrast, <clears throat> growth in <clears throat> business fixed in in investment appears to be slowing, and activity in the housing sector looks to be softening, in part reflecting higher mortgage rates. The tightening in financial conditions that we've seen in recent months should continue to temper growth and help bring demand into better balance with supply. As shown in our summary of economic projections, FOMC participants have marked down their projections for economic activity with the median projection for real GDP growth running below 2 percent through 2024. The labor market has remained <clears throat> extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50-year low, job vacancies at historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Over the past three months, employment rose by an average of 408,000 jobs per month down from the average pace seen earlier in the year, but still robust. Improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, while labor supply remains subdued, with the labor force participation rate little changed since January. FOMC participants expect supply and demand conditions in the labor market to come into better balance, easing the upward pressures on wages and prices. The median projection in the SEP for the unemployment rate rises somewhat over the next few years, moving from 3.7 percent at the end of this year to 4.1 percent in 2024, levels that are noticeably above the March projections. Inflation remains <clears throat> well above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Over the 12 months ending in April, total PCE prices rose 6.3 percent, excluding the volatile food and energy categories. Core prices rose 4.9 percent. In May, the 12 month change in the consumer price index came in above expectations at 8.6 percent, and the change in the core CPI was 6 percent. Aggregate demand is strong. Supply constraints have been larger and long lasting than anticipated and price pressures have spread to a broad range of goods and services. The surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is boosting prices for gasoline and food and is creating additional upward pressure on inflation. And COVID-related COVID lockdowns in China are likely to exacerbate supply chain disruptions. FOMC participants have revised up their projections for inflation this year particularly for total PCE inflation given developments in food and energy prices. The median projection is 5.2 percent this year and falls to 2.6 percent next year and 2.2 percent in 2024. Participants continue to see risks to inflation as weighted to the upside. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and price and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. 
We are highly attentive to the risks high inflation poses to both, so both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. Against the backdrop of the rapidly evolving economic environment, our policy has been adapting, and it will continue to do so. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by three-quarters of a percentage point, resulting in a one-and-a-half percentage point increase in the target range so far this year. The committee reiterated that it anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet, which plays an important role in firming the stance of monetary policy. Coming out of our last meeting in May, there was a broad sense on the committee that a, a half percentage point increase in the target range should be considered at this meeting if economic and financial conditions evolved in line with expectations. We also stated that we were highly attentive to inflation risks and that we would be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Since then, inflation has again surprised to the upside. Some indicators of inflation expectations have risen, and projections for inflation this year have been revised up notably. In response to these developments, the committee decided that a larger increase in the target range was warranted at today's meeting. <clears throat> this continues our approach of expeditiously moving our policy rate up to more normal levels and it will help ensure that longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2 percent. As shown in the SEP, <clears throat> the median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 3.4 percent at the end of this year, a, po a percentage point and a half higher than projected in March, and 0.9 percentage point above the median estimate of its longer run value. The median projection rises further to 3.8 percent at the end of next year, and declines to 3.4 percent in 2024, still above the median longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee plan or decision, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. Over coming months, <clears throat> we will be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down, consistent with inflation returning to 2 percent. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. The pace of those changes will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. Clearly, today's 75 basis point increase is an unusually large one, and I do not expect moves of this size to be common. From the perspective of today, either a 50 basis point or a 75 basis point increase seems most likely at our next meeting. We will, however, make our decisions meeting by meeting, and will continue to, to communicate our thinking as clearly as we can. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keep longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Making appropriate monetary policy in this uncertain environment requires a recognition that the economy often evolves in unexpected ways. Inflation has obviously uh, surprised to the upside over the past year, and further surprises could be in store. We therefore will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. And we will strive to avoid adding uncertainty to what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain time. We are highly attentive to inflation risk risks and determined to take the measures necessary to restore price stability. The American economy is very strong and well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Howard Schneider with Reuters. Um, uh, two related questions, uh, Chair Powell. Did you feel you uh, boxed yourself in with the language you used at the last press conference on uh, 50 basis point hikes in June and July? And would you please give us uh, as detailed a sense as you can of what role you played uh, in reshaping market expectations so quickly on Monday? So um, as you know, we, we uh, always aim to provide as much clarity as we can about our policy intentions subject to the in inherent uncertainty in the economic outlook, because we think monetary policy is more effective when market participants understand 
how policy will, will evolve when they understand our, our objective function, our reaction function. Um, and in the current highly unusual circumstances with inflation well above our goal, we think it's helpful, helpful to provide, provide even more clarity than usual, um, again, subject to uncertainty in the outlook. So, um, and I think over the course of, over the course of this year, financial uh, markets have responded uh, and, and have generally shown that they understand the path we're, we're, uh, we're laying out. It, of course, it remains data dependent. Um, and so that's what we generally think about guidance, and that's why we offer it. And of course, when we offered that, when I offered that guidance uh, at the last meeting, I did say that it was subject to the economy performing about in line with expectations. I also said that uh, if the economy performed, if data came in worse than expected, then we would consider moving even more aggressively. So uh, we, got the, we got the CPI data and also some data on inflation expectations uh, late last week. And we thought for a while, and we thought, well, this is the appropriate thing to do. So then the question is, what do you do? And do you wait six weeks to do it at the next meeting? And I think the answer is that's not where we are with this. So we decided we needed to go ahead. And so we did. And uh, that's, really the, that's really how we made the decision. Thanks for taking our questions. Gina Smilek with the New York Times. You, I guess I wonder if you could describe for us a little bit how you're deciding how aggressive you need to be. So obviously 75 today, what did 75 achieve that 50 wouldn't have and why not just go for a full percentage point at some point? Sure. So if you take a step back, what we're looking for is compelling evidence that inflationary pressures are abating and that inflation is moving back down. And we'd like to see that in uh, in the form of a series of declining uh, monthly inflation readings. That's what we're looking for. And by this point, uh, we had actually been expecting to see clear signs of at least inflation flattening out and ideally beginning to decline. We've said that we'd be data dependent, focused on incoming data, highly attentive to inflation risks, the things that I mentioned um, uh, to Howard moments ago. So contrary to expectations, inflation again surprised to the upside. Indicators, some indicators of inflation expectations have risen. Uh, and projections of this year have moved up notably. So we thought that strong action was warranted at this meeting, and today we delivered that in the form of a 75 basis point rate hike, as I mentioned. So what was the, the point of it really is this. Um, we've been moving rates up uh, expeditiously to more normal levels. And over the course of the seven months since we, since we pivoted and began moving in this direction, we've seen uh, financial conditions tighten, and appropriately so. Um, but the federal funds rate, even after this move, is at 1.6 percent. So uh, again, the committee uh, is moving rates up expeditiously to more normal levels. And we came to the view that um, we'd like to do a little more front end loading on that. So I think that the, the SEP gives you the levels that people think are appropriate at, a, at given points in time. This was really about the speed with which you would get there. So as I mentioned, we. we 75 basis points today. I said the next meeting could, could well be about a decision between 50 and 75. That would put us at the end of the July meeting, you know, in, in that range of, in that more normal range. And that's a desirable place to be because you begin to have more optionality there about the speed with which you would proceed going forward. Just, just talking about the SEP for a second, what, what it really says is that committee participants widely would like to see policy at a modestly restricted, restrictive level at the end of this year. And that's six months from now. And you know, so much data and so much can happen. So remember how highly uncertain this is. But so that is generally a range of three to three and a half percent. That's where people are. And that's, that's what they want to see, knowing what they know now and understanding that we need to be, we need to show resolve, but also be flexible to incoming data as we see it. If things are better, we don't need to do that much. So. And if they're not, then we, you know, we either do that much or possibly even more. Uh, but in any case, it will be very data dependent. Then you're looking at next year, and what you're seeing is people see more, a bit more tightening in, in, in a range of maybe 3.5 to 4 percent. And that's generally what people see as the appropriate path for getting inflation under control and starting back down and then getting back down to 2 percent. So 75 basis points seem like the right, the right thing to do at this meeting. And, um, 
and uh, that's what we did. Steve. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Thank you for taking my question, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Um, you have not used the phrase in a long time, monetary policy is in a good place, which is a phrase that you used to use often. Um, now that the committee is projecting 4% on a, or 3.8% next year in terms of the funds rate, uh, which is similar to where the market is now, uh, the, the futures market of 4% funds rate next year, do you think that's a level that is going to be sufficiently high enough to deal with and bring down the inflation problem? And just as a follow-up, could you break that apart for me? How much of that is restrictive and how much of that is a normal positive rate that ought to be embedded or not, in your opinion, in the funds rate? Thank you. Sure. So the, the question really is, how high does the rate really need to go? And this is, you know, the estimates on the committee are, are in that range of 35 to 4 percent. And how do you think about that? Well, you can think about the, the longer run neutral rate. You can compare it to that, and we think that's in the mid twos. Um, you can look, frankly, at broader financial conditions. You can look at, you know, asset prices. You can look at the effect you're having on the economy, rates, asset prices, credit spreads, all of those things go into that. You can, you can also look at the yield curve and ask all along the yield curve, where is, wh where is the policy rate? So for much of the yield curve now, real rates are positive. That's not true at the short end. At, at the short end of the yield curve in, in the early years, you don't have real, neg you have negative rates still. So that, I, that, but to, that really is one data point. It's one part of financial conditions. So I, th I think you, you, I, I have to look at it this way. We move the policy rate. That affects financial conditions, and that affects the economy. You know, we have, of course, ways, rigorous ways to think about it, but ultimately it comes down to do we think financial conditions are in a place where they're having the desired effect on the economy? And that desired effect is we'd like to see you know, demand moderating. Demand is very hot still in the economy. We'd like to see the labor market getting ba better in balance between supply and demand, and that can happen both from supply and demand. Right now, there's d demand is substantially higher than, than available supply, though, so we feel that there's a role for us in moderating demand. Those are the things we can affect with our, uh, with our policy tools. There are many things we can't affect, uh, and, and those would be you know, the things, uh, the, the commodity price issues that we're having around the world due to the war in uh, Ukraine and, um, and the fallout from that, and also just the, all of the supply side things that are still, you know, pushing upward on inflation. So that's, that's really how, how I think I would think about it. But, but does 3.8%, 4% get it done? Does it get the job done and bring you back to inflation? I think it, it, it's certainly a, a, a in the range of plausible numbers. I think we'll know when we get there, really. I mean, I, I, honestly, though, that, that would be, you would have positive real rates, I think, and inflation coming down by then. I think you'd have positive real rates across the curve. Um, I think that, the, you know, the neutral rate is pretty low these days. So uh, I, I would think it would, but you know what? We're going to we're gonna find that out empirically. We're not, we're not going to be completely model-driven about this. We're going we're gonna to be looking at, at, at this, keeping our eyes open and reacting to incoming data both on financial conditions and on what's happening in the economy. Thanks. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Charpel, you've said that you like your policy to work through expectations, and now obviously this decision was something quite different from how you and almost all of your colleagues had set those expectations during the intermediate period. And I know you just said that what changed was really the inflation data, the inflation expectations data, but I'm wondering on the inflation expectations data, was there something you saw that was unsettling enough to risk eroding the credibility of your verbal guidance by doing something so different from what you had socialized before? So if you look at it, we look at a broad range of inflation expectations. Um, so you've got the public, you've got surveys of the public and of experts, and, and you've also got market-based. And I think if you look across that broad range of data, what you see is that uh, expectations are still in the place, very much in the place where short-term inflation is going to be high, but comes down sharply over the next couple of years. That's, that's really where inflation expectations are. And also, as you get away from this episode, they get back down close to 2 percent. And so this is really very important to us that that remain the case. And I think if you look for most measures, most of the time, that's what you see. 
to even, if we even see a couple of indicators that, that bring that into question, we, we take that very seriously. We do not take this for granted. We take it very seriously. So the preliminary Michigan reading, it's a preliminary reading. It might be revised. Nonetheless, it was quite eye-catching, and, and we noticed that. We also noticed that, that the uh, index of common inflation expectations at the board has moved up after being pretty flat for a long time. So we're watching that, and we're thinking, this is something we need to take seriously. And that is one of the factors, as I, I mentioned, one of the factors in our deciding to move ahead with 75 basis points today was what we saw in, in inflation expectations. We're, we're absolutely determined to keep them anchored at 2%. Uh, that was one of the reasons. The other was just the, the CPI rating. So if you saw a movement like that again, another tick up in inflation expectations, uh, would that put a 75 or even 100 basis point increase in play uh, at your next meeting? You know, we're going to, I'll just say, we're going to react to the incoming data and uh, appropriately, I think. So I, I, I wouldn't want to put a number on what that might be. The main thing is to get, to get rates up and, and then pretty soon we'll be in an area where, where, where we're, I, I think, as you get closer to the end of the year, you're in, you're in an, a range where you've got restrictive policy, which is appropriate, 40-year 40, 40 highs in inflation. We, we think that policy is going to need to be restrictive. And we don't know how restrictive. So um, I think that's how we'll take it. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin from Axios. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, the uh, the late-breaking kind of decision to go to 75 basis points, uh, do you worry that that will make policy guidance a less effective tool in the future? Uh, and should we think of that as a kind of symmetrical reaction function if we start to get uh, soft readings on inflation or if, uh, if the labor market starts to roll over? To take your second question first, yes. I mean, I, I think we're, we're again, we're, we're going, we're resolved to take this on, but we're going to be flexible in the implementation of it. Sorry, and your, your question was guidance. So, again, the, the overall exercise is that we try to be, provide as much clarity about our policy intentions as we can, because we think that makes monetary policy work better. There's, it's always a trade-off, because you have to live with that guidance. And um, so you do it, and it helps a lot of the time. I frankly think this year has been a demonstration of how well it can work. We, you know, with, the f with us having really just done a very little in the way of raising uh, interest rates, financial conditions have tightened quite significantly through, through the expectations channel as we've made it clear what our plans are. So I, I think that's been a very healthy uh, uh, thing to be happening. So, and, and I would hope that, our, that our, it's, it's always going to be, that any, any uh, guidance that we give is always going to be subject to things working out about as we expect. And in this particular situation, you know, we're, we're looking for something specific, and that is progress on inflation. We want to see progress. We want to see inflation can't go down until it flattens out. And that's what we're looking to see. And, and if we don't see that, then that's the kind of thing that will cause, even if we, can, we don't see progress for a longer period, that could cause us to react. But we will, we will soon enough, we will be seeing some progress at some point. And, and, and we'll react appropriately to that, too. But I, I, would, I would like to think, though, that our guidance is still credible, but it's always going to be conditional on, on what happens. This is an unusual situation to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, some data late in, in uh, during blackout, pretty close, very close to our meeting, very unusual to one that would actually change the outcome. So um, I, I, I've only seen in my 10 years plus here at the Fed, I've only seen something like that, even close to that, one or two times. So I don't think it's something that will come up a great deal. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. On the clear and convincing threshold uh, for the inflation trajectory, what is the level of realized inflation uh, that meets that criteria? And how is the committee thinking about the potential trade-off of much higher unemployment than even, forecast, than even what's forecasted in the SEP if inflation is not moderating you know, at this acceptable pace? So the second part I didn't get. Um, if, uh, you know, what's the potential trade-off with higher uh, unemployment than even what's forecasted in the SEP if inflation is not moderating at an acceptable pace? Right. So w what we want to see is, is you know, a series of declining monthly readings for inflation, and we like to see inflation headed down. So um, 
but you know, and right right now our policy rate is well below neutral, right? So the, the, soon enough we'll we'll have our policy rate. Let's assume the world works about, out about like the SEP says. The policy rate will be up where we think it should be, and then the question would be, do you slow down? Does it make you you know that you'll be making these judgments about is it appropriate now to slow down from 50 to 25, let's say, or speed up? You know that so that's the kind of thinking we'll we'll be doing, and we'll be again we're looking ultimately. We're not going to declare victory until we see uh, a series of these, you know, really see convincing evidence, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down. And th that's what I mean by, that's what it would take for us to say, okay, we think, uh, we think this, is, this job is done. Um, because we saw, and frankly, we saw last year, inflation came down over the course of the summer and then turned right around and went back up. So I think we're going to be careful about, uh, about declaring victory. But our, again, the implementation of our policy is going to be going to be flexible and sensitive to incoming data. Are you more concerned now that uh, to bring down inflation, it's going to require more than just some pain at this point? So again, I, th I think that um, I do think that uh, their objective, and this is what's reflected in the SCP, but our objective really is to bring inflation down to 2 percent while the labor market remains strong. I think that um, what's becoming more clear is that, that many factors that we don't control are going to play a very significant role in, in deciding whether that's possible or not. And there I'm thinking, of course, of commodity prices, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, supply chain, things like that, where we really can't, we really can't the monetary policy stance, you know, stance doesn't affect those things. So, but having said that, there, there is a, you know, there is a path, the, the, there is a path for us to get there. Um, it's not getting easier. Uh, it's, it's getting more challenging because of these external forces. And that, that path is to, to move demand down, and you have a lot of surplus demand in, uh, take, for example, in the, uh, in the labor market. Uh, so, it, you have two va job vacancies essentially for every person seek, actively seeking a job, and that has led to a real imbalance in wage negotiating. You, you could get to a place where, where that ratio was, was a more, at a more normal level, and you, wouldn't ex you would expect to see those wage pressures move back down to a level where people are still getting healthy wage increases, real wage increases, but at a level that's consistent with 2 percent inflation. So, that's, that's a possibility, and you could say the same thing about some of the product markets where there's just excess capacity and, you know, where the, really where the, the strong demand has gone into, sorry, where there's, where there's their capacity constrained, right? So you have effectively what we think of as a vertical supply curve or close to it. So demand comes in and it's very strong and it, it shows up in higher prices, not, not higher quantities, not more cars because they can't make the cars because they don't have the semiconductors. So in principle, that could work in reverse. When demand comes down, you could see, and it's not guaranteed, but you could see prices coming down more than the typical economic relationships that you see in the textbooks would suggest because of the unusual situation we're in on the supply side. So there's a pathway there. It is, it is not going to be easy. Uh, and, you know, the, they're, they're, again, it's our objective, but um, uh, as I mentioned, it's going to depend to some extent on factors we don't control. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you for taking our questions. Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. So the new projections show the unemployment rate ticking up through 2024. Is a higher unemployment rate necessary in order to combat inflation? And what is lost if the unemployment rate has to go up and people lose their jobs in order to control inflation? Thank you. So you're right. In, in, the, in the SEP, we have unemployment going up to four point. The median is 4.1%. Is, uh, is there are, of course, a range of, of, uh, of actual forecasts. And I, I would characterize that if you, if you were to get inflation down to, you know, on its way down to 2% and the unemployment went up to, rate went up to 4.1%, that's still a, you know, historically low level. You know, we hadn't seen we hadn't seen rates unemployment rates below four percent until a couple of years ago. For we'd seen it for like one year in the last fifty. 
So the idea that, you know, 3.6 percent I mean, is historically low in, in the last century. So a 4.1 percent unemployment rate with, with inflation well on its way to 2 percent, I think that would be, I, I, would, I think that would be a successful outcome. So we're not looking to, to have a higher unemployment rate, but I would say that we, I would certainly look at that as a successful outcome. You know, we're not, again, we're not, we don't seek to put people out of work, of course. We, we never think too many people are working and fewer people need to have jobs. But we also think that you, you really cannot have the kind of labor market we want without price stability. And we have, to, we have to go back and establish price stability so we can have that kind of labor market. And that's a labor market where, um, you know, where workers are getting wage increases. Maybe the, maybe the workers at the lower end of the spectrum are getting the biggest wage increases, as they were before the pandemic, um, where participation is high, where there's lots of job opportunities, where it's just a really, I mean, the, the labor market we had before the pandemic was, that's what we want to get back to. And you see, you see, you know, disparities between various groups at historic lows. We'd love to get back to that place. But to get there, it's, it's not going to happen with, you know, with the levels of inflation we have. So we have to, we have to restore that. And um, it, it really is in service in the medium and longer term of the kind of labor market we want and hope to achieve. Hi, Chair Powell, Matthew Bosa with Bloomberg. Um, so, as you just mentioned, the committee is now projecting a half percentage point rise in the unemployment rate in the SEPs um, over the next couple of years, um, and it removed a line from its policy statement about thinking that the labor market can remain strong uh, while it tightens policy. Um, you just mentioned that that is still your objective, though, so I'm wondering if you could explain why that line was removed from the statement and also whether um, this means the FOMC is trying to induce a recession now to bring inflation down. Not trying to reduce induce a recession now. Let's be clear about that. We're trying to achieve uh, two percent inflation consistent with a strong labor market. That's that's what we're trying to do. So let me talk about that sentence. Um, clearly, it's our goal to bring about two percent inflation while keeping the labor market strong, right? And and that's that's kind of what the SEP says. That the SEP has inflation getting down to two two a little above two percent in 2024 with with unemployment at 4.1 percent. So and this is a strong labor market. This is a good labor market. Um, and as I mentioned, there are pathways to do it. But those pathways have become much more challenging due to factors that are not under our control. Th again, thinking here of the fallout from the war in the Ukraine, which has brought a spike in, you know, prices of energy, food, fertilizer, industrial chemicals, and also just the supply chains more broadly, which have been larger than, or in longer lasting than anticipated. So the sentence that we deleted said that we believe that appropriate monetary policy effectively alone can bring about the result of 2 percent inflation with a strong labor market. And so much of it is really not down to monetary policy. It just didn't, it just, the, the, the sentence isn't, it, it, it kind of says on its face that monetary policy alone can do this. And that's, that's not, that just didn't seem appropriate, so we took the sentence out. And, and given the new projections for the unemployment rate, could you talk a little bit about what accounts for, you know, such reduced conf uh, confidence against, say, a month ago or three months ago that um, inflation will largely normalize on its own as these supply side issues uh, get worked out. Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, I, th I think you've seen, again, we've been expecting progress and we didn't get that. We got, we got sort of the opposite. So I also think the situation really since the, you know, the consequences of the Ukraine war become more and more uh, clear, what you're seeing is the situation getting getting more difficult. And you look around the world. I mean, lots of countries are lots of countries are looking at inflation of 10 percent, and it's largely due to commodities prices. But all over the world, you are seeing um, these effects, and so the, and we're seeing them here. Gas prices, you know, all-time highs and things like that. That's not be, that's not something we can do something about. So um, that that's that is really. Um, and by the way, headline inflation. Headline inflation is important for expectations. People, are, the public's expectations, why would they be distinguishing between core inflation and headline inflation? Core inflation is something we think about because it, it is a better predictor of future inflation. But headline inflation is what people experience. They don't know what core is. Why, why would they? They have no reason to. So that's expectations are very much at risk due to high headline inflation. So it's become, 
the environment has become more difficult, clearly, in the last four or five months, and hence the need for the policy actions that we took today, hence our resolution to, uh, you know, to get uh, rates up and, and ultimately get them to where we think they need to be um, in coming months. Thanks, Chair Powell. Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. Um, I want to ask you, you talked about CPI going to 8.6 percent. The retail sales surprised the market by falling, and then revisions to the previous months w were down. Are you hearing from contacts about consumers slowing spending or changing their habits? So we're, of course, watching very, very carefully for that. And, you know, looking at the retail sale, the, the big store numbers and all that kind of thing. And so, I, but I think the fair summary of what we see is you see continuing shifts in consumption, you see some, some things getting, sales going down, but overall, spending is very strong. The consumer is in really good shape financially, they're spending, there's no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the economy. People are talking about it a lot, C consumer confidence is very low, that's probably related to gas prices, um, and, and also just stock prices to some extent for other people, but um, that's, that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing a broad slowdown. We, 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 we see job growth slowing, but it's still at quite robust levels. We see the economy slowing a bit, but still growth levels, healthy growth levels. So then as you are raising rates in this economy, how closely are you watching consumer spending, or is there uh, something, another indicator that you're watching more closely? It would be hard to watch anything much more closely than we watch consumer spending. But we watch everything. You know, we watch business fixed investment, which actually has softened a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, we watch, we, we, we're responsible for watching everything. But, you know, uh, uh, consumption is 60 some percent of the economy, two thirds of the economy. So naturally, we spend a lot of time on that. And again, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of flows back and forth. But ultimately, uh, it, it it does appear that the U.S. economy is, is in a strong position and well positioned to, to deal with uh, higher interest rates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Michael McKee from Bloomberg Radio and Television. Uh, are you targeting headline inflation now or core inflation? In other words, uh, how far would you ch chase oil prices if they keep going up, if that's going to be the component that drives expectations? Uh, would you risk recession for a headline rate if the core rate is holding steady or starting to go down? So the, we're responsible for inflation in the law, and inflation means headline inflation. So that's our ultimate goal. We, of course, like all central banks do, look very, very carefully at core inflation because it is, it's a much better predictor, and it's, much, it's, it's uh, a much better predictor of where inflation is going, and it's also more relevant to our tools. As I mentioned, the parts that don't go into core are mostly outside the scope of our tools, so we look at that. But, you know, it, it's, it, it, the current situation is particularly difficult because of what I mentioned about expectations. We, 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 we can't affect really. I mean, the energy prices are set by global commodity prices. And most of, w of food, not all of it, but most food prices are, are pretty heavily influenced by global commodity prices, too, also other things. So we can't really have much of an effect. But we have to be mindful of, of the potential effect on inflation expectations from headlines. So it, it's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, and we ca again, we can't do much about, about the, the, the difference between the, the elements that make up headline that are not in core. Could I just, uh, as a follow-up, get a clarification on the SEP? When the uh, members uh, gave their forecasts, uh, when were they inserted into the record? Uh, were they revised after the CPI or uh, Michigan numbers came out? In other words, does, does the SEP as we have it now reflect the same factors that led you to go to a 75 basis point move? The SEP is, is of one piece. It, it, you know, it, it, re it reflects the, all of the economic readings. It also reflects the 75 basis point increase. This is important. So people had that in hand when, they, when their SEPs were submitted. So it's, it, in other words, it's not in addition to what's in the SEP. The SEP, everyone's SEP reflects their thinking about this rate increase and, and what's going forward.
Hi, Victoria Guida from Politico. Um, I wanted to ask about how you're measuring progress, especially since you've now um, started front-loading rate hikes more. Um, you know, you've talked about how you want to see inflation coming down over a series of reports, and I guess I'm curious whether you think inflation data itself is um, a really good indicator or whether you know, you might be concerned that it's a lagging indicator or that it might send confusing signals given that, as you've talked about, there are sort of supply and demand aspects. And um, I, I guess my question is, you know, do you think that inflation will tell you, inflation data will tell you when you've gone to where you need to go or do you just feel like maybe it's better to overshoot than to undershoot? So, I, you know, I think, the, the role that we can play, maybe a way to get at it is to say that the role that we can play is around demand, right? So, and we'll be able to see the areas that we can affect are those that are associated with excess demand. And we'll be able to see our effect on, for example, job openings in real time. So, we, that, and that would tell us what's, that would tell us about wages. Wages are not principally responsible for the inflation that we're seeing, but it, it, going forward, they would be very important, particularly in the service sector. <laughs> So, um, sorry, I, I'm not sure I'm getting to your question. My, my question is, is inflation data itself the best indicator for when you're getting to where you need to go, or might it lead you to go too far? There's always a risk of going too far or going that far enough. And uh, it's, it's going to be a very difficult judgment to make, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe it'll be really clear. But we're, we're, and we're quite mindful of the of the dangers. And, but I, I will say the, the, the worst mistake we could make would be to fail, which it's not an option. You know, we have to restore price stability. We really do. Because everything, it, it, it's the bedrock of the economy. If you don't have price stability, it, the economy is really not going to work the way it's supposed to. It, it won't work for people. Their wages will be being eaten up. So we want to get the job done. This, is, this inflation happened relatively recently. We don't think that it's affecting expectations in, in any kind of fundamental way. We don't think that we're seeing a wage price spiral. We think that, 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 the, that the public uh, generally sees us as, as very likely to be successful in getting inflation down to 2 percent, and that's critical. It's absolutely key to the whole thing that, that we, we sustain that confidence. So that's how we're thinking about it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Brian Chung with Yahoo Finance. Um, I just want to expand, I guess, on what you just said now about the general public feeling like uh, you know you can get this done. When you talk about consumer sentiment being down, household inflation expectations being up, recession just broadly being dinner table talk, does the general feel among American households and also businesses uh, square with your explanation of the economy, given that the description of inflation, the statement didn't change between May and June? Thanks. So. Clearly, um, people don't like inflation a lot, and many people are experiencing it really for the first time, because we have we haven't had anything like this kind of inflation in 40 years, and it's it's really something people don't like, and they're experiencing that, and that's showing up in their in surveys and in all kinds of ways, uh, and we understand that, and we understand the hardship that people are experiencing from high inflation, and we're determined to do what we can to get inflation back down. So that, that's really what we're saying. Uh, we're not, I'm not, uh, uh, clearly it's, it's an incredibly unpopular thing, and, and it's very painful for people. So, uh, I, but I, I guess what I'm saying is the question, really critical question from the perspective of doing our job is making sure that the public does have confidence that we have the tools and we'll use them and they do work to bring inflation back down over time. It, it will take some time, we think, to get inflation back down, but we will do that. Chris. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris Rugaver at Associated Press. You have talked about inflation a few times uh, and mentioned oil prices, uh, China lockdowns. Um, but aside from rises in commodity prices such, such as gas prices, we're also, we're also seeing stickier measures of inflation increasing, such as the Cleveland Fed's median and trimmed mean CPIs. I mean, how persistent do you see those underlying measures of inflation, uh, and how do you expect to, and where do you see those going in the near future? Yeah. 
So as I mentioned, I think in my opening statement, the um, inflation has started, it started off in quite narrow, very directly uh, pandemic related uh, areas and it spread now broadly across the economy and into the services sector as well. It was really in the goods sector at the beginning. And in particular, you're seeing um, in travel now, if you've flown on a plane lately, uh, planes are very full and plane tickets are very expensive. Some of that will be passed through of energy prices, but it's so you're experiencing services inflation. Um, shelter inflation is is high. So, um, so the, the question, and, and you, you see the the Cleveland measure going up, other and many other measures are going up. So, so it's a time when we're not seeing progress, and we want to see progress, and that's really another part of why we did what we did today and why, why, why the SEP looks like it does is that we, we see it as, uh, as appropriate to get the policy rate up to restrictive levels, which would be in the thinking of the committee somewhere in the range of three to three and a half percent by year end. And, and, then, and then after that, you see what the rest of the SEP says. So I, ho I hope that's responsive to your question. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Chair Powell, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Do you still think a softish landing is possible? And how would you define that at this point, considering the revised projections for unemployment, GDP, inflation? So I think that I think what's in the SEP would certainly qualify, would certainly meet that test. Uh, you know, if you see, you're looking at getting that back down to a, almost a 2 percent inflation by 2024 and the unemployment rate is still as low as 4.1 percent, that would be, I would call that as, qual as meeting that test. Um, do I still think that we can do that? I, I do. I think there's, I think there, there's, I, I don't want to be the handicapper here. I just, that, that is our objective um, and I, I do think it's possible. I, like I said though, I think that events of the last few months have raised the degree of difficulty, created great challenges. And again, the, the answer to the question, can we still do it, it, it there's, a, there's a much bigger chance now that it'll depend on factors that we don't control, which is, you know, fluctuations and spikes in commodity prices could, could, could wind up taking that option out of our hands. So we just don't know. Uh, but we're, you know, we're focused on, very, very focused on getting inflation back down to 2 percent, which we think is essential. Uh, for the benefit of the public and also to, to put us on a path back to a sustainably strong labor market like the one we had before the pandemic. Greg. Thank you. Greg Robb from Market Watch. Chair Powell, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. You know, economists are worried that you're kind of hitting the economy with the sledgehammer and that there, now there's even more risk of a recession than when than a 50-50 path of rates. So could you talk a little bit more about that and what evidence would get you to stop rate hikes and maybe even reverse them? Sure. So it, as I mentioned, financial conditions have tightened um, over the last seven months and that's a good thing, we think. But the federal funds rate, even after this increase is at 1.6 percent. So it's hard to see how that, that is too high of a rate. And if, even if we did another, you know, we're, so we're going to get here by the end of the summer somewhere in the twos probably. Still, that's, a, that's still a low rate. So that's not a rate that is calculated to bring a recession on. And we'll, by then we'll have seen a whole lot more data. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, the committee's views are around a a, a mo modestly restrictive stance, which would be in the three to three and a half percent range by the end of this year. But that's, that's, you know, conditioned on that being the appropriate thing to do. If we see data going in a different direction, it'll be reflected in our, in our policy, as you see today. You know, we'll be watching if, <clears throat> uh, if, if things go in a direction we don't expect, then we're going to adapt. And, and I would say this is a highly uncertain environment, extraordinarily uncertain environment. So. Uh, uh, again, will be will be determined and resolved, but flexible. Hey, Evan. Evan Reiser, Market News International. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, <coughs> I was wondering if the Fed has initiated a review of the conduct of monetary policy over the last two years or so, um, given the inflation, and will that be shared with the public? 
And then secondly, given the, the illiquidity and extraordinary volatility in financial markets, are you concerned that QT will make that worse? Sorry, what was your question on QT? Um, just given the Ill illiquidity and extraordinary volatility in financial markets, whether QT will make things worse. Ah. So, um, of course, we've been looking, you know, very carefully and hard at why inflation picked up so much more than expected last year and why it proved so persistent. We, uh, it's hard to overstate the extent of uh, interest we have in that question morning, noon, and night. So, um, but you have to put, you have to understand the context for, really the context is this, for, you know, decades before the, the pandemic and the reopening, you had a world where inflation was dominated by <clears throat> disinflationary forces such as declining population or, or aging demographics, let's call it that, globalization enabled by technology, other factors, low productivity. So, and you know, that's, that's how all the models work it, it is, you know, decades and decades of data. They, they look at that, it's a very flat Phillips curve work and, and the supply shocks tend to be transient, right? So we have now experienced an extraordinary series of shocks if you think about it. The pandemic, the response, the reopening, inflation, followed by the war in Ukraine, followed by uh, shutdowns in China, the war in Ukraine potentially having effects for years here. So we're aware that a, a different set of forces are driving the economy. We have been, obviously, for quite a while, that this is a different, these forces are different. Inflation's behaving differently. And in our thinking, it really is a question of very strong demand, but you, you, could, you couldn't get this kind of inflation without a change on the supply side, which is there for anybody to see, which is these, these blockages and shortages and people dropping out of the labor force and, and things like that. So that's, that's how we're looking at it. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of work internally on uh, and thinking about, about what all that means. You don't, the thing is, you don't know whether those forces are, how, to the, what extent are they going to be sustained? In other words, will we go back to a world where that looks a little more like the old world, or are we going, really going to be in a world where major supply shocks go on and on? The history is you, you see these waves of supply shocks, as you did in, in the 70s, and then they go away, and, and you know, sort of there, there's a new normal and things settle down. But honestly, we don't know uh, what, what that's going to be. In the meantime, we have to find price stability in this new world and maximum employment in this new world where clearly inflationary forces are, you're seeing them everywhere. Again, if you look, look around the world at where inflation levels are, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's not just here. In fact, we're sort of in the middle of the pack, although I think we have, a, we have of course, a different kind of inflation than other people have, and uh, uh, partly because our economy is stronger and, and more highly recovered. So that, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we've done a lot of introspection and work on that. And um, sorry, on, on QT, um, you know, we've communicated really clearly to the markets about what, what we're going to do there. Markets seem to be okay with it. Um, we're, we're, we're phasing in. Um, Treasury issuance is down quite a lot, quite a lot from where it's been. So uh, I have no reason to think markets are forward looking and they see this coming. I have no reason to think it, it uh, will lead to illiquidity and problems. It seems to be kind of understood and accepted at this point. Thanks. For the last question, we'll go to Mark. Hey, Mr. Chairman, Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. I um, wonder what your assessment is about the outlook for the housing market given the uh, years-long increase in home prices and now the sharp rise in mortgage rates and all that, of course, given the uh, heightened sensitivity around the housing market, given the fact that it was a trigger for the great financial crisis over a decade ago. Thank you. Sure. So rates were, were very low. Um, it, it, a good place to start is that rates were very, very low for quite a while because of the pandemic and the, and, you know, the need to do everything we could to support the economy when unemployment was 14 percent and the true unemployment rate was, was well higher than that. So, and that, you know, that was, uh, rates are low and now, and now they're coming back up to more normal or above levels. So um, in the meantime, while rates were low and while demand was really high, obviously demand for housing 
changed from wanting to live in urban areas to some extent to living in, in single family homes in the suburbs famously and so the demand was just suddenly much higher and uh, low, so we saw prices moving up very, very uh, strongly for the last couple of years. So that changes now and rates have moved up. We're well aware that rate, mortgage rates have moved up a lot and you, you're, you know, you're seeing a changing housing market. We're watching it to see what will happen. How much will it really affect residential investment? Not really sure. Uh, what will, how much will it affect housing prices? You know, not really sure. It's, uh, I mean, obviously we're watching that quite carefully. You would think over time, I mean, it, it, so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of supply in the housing market of unfinished homes. And as those come online, it, whereas the, the, the supply of finished homes, the inventory of finished homes that are for sale is incredibly low, historically low. So that it's still a very tight market. So prices may keep going up for a while, even in a world where rates are, are up. So it's a complicated situation. We watch it very carefully. Um, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, y you need a bit of a reset. You, we, we need to get back to a place where, where supply and demand are, are back uh, together and where inflation is down low again and mortgages are, mortgage rates are low again. So this, this will be a process whereby we ideally we, we, we do our work in a way that where the housing market settles in a new place and housing availability and, and credit availability are at appropriate levels. So thank you very much. <clears throat>